So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, I'm an economist. I, uh, I specialise in family economics. And uh, one of my papers, my PhD thesis, I was looking at the impact, I was trying to elicit the causal impact of education on, on marital age gaps between spouses. And uh, actually, the, the, the paper um, transformed into uh, looking at the trade off between age gaps and matching on education. So, the standard disclaimer. So as an economist, I would say to you that your choice of spouse is an economic decision. And it's probably the most important economic decision that you will make in your lifetime. Your choice of spouse may affect whether you actually participate in the labour market. Uh, it may affect the, uh, the, the level of wages that you're willing to go and work for. Um, your choice of spouse may affect your health. There's a lot of literature that looks at that. I would argue that most people would agree that your choice of spouse is going to affect your happiness. It may affect whether you have children in the first place, how many children you have, and also the outcomes of your children. And uh, looking at all of these things, we can also think that who you marry, and uh, when we take society, who people in society choose to marry, this is going to go and feed into an important determinant of intergenerational mobility as well as income um, equality, in income inequality. So for these reasons, marriage is of interest to economists such as myself. But we also know that like most people who are making a marriage decision probably don't have economics at the forefront of their minds. However, what we do see is that uh, a number of, uh, a couple of very noticeable features emerge in the majority of marriages. Firstly, that husbands tend to be slightly older than their wives. Like spouses tend to be of similar age, but husbands are generally uh, slightly older than their wives. And also that we have positive assortative matching on education between spouses. By that I mean that high, uh, individuals, so highly qualified husbands tend to have wives who are also highly qualified and vice versa those individuals at the lower tail of uh, the education distribution tend to marry each other. So this is a phenomenon that is actually, uh, the, the, this, this age gap uh, phenomenon is very pervasive. So for all 218 countries that I could go and get data for, from the world, uh, for, uh, from the UN, uh, in every single country there is an average uh, positive age gap that uh, men are slightly older than their, their wives. And there's also a large literature in, uh, uh, in uh, the economics marriage literature that talks about assortative matching on education. Um, and there's been some work using uh, US census data that shows over the, the past five decades there's been an increasing degree of homogamy i.e. Uh, that there's equal levels of qualifications between spouses. So we see, so this leads to a polarisation of we have more high qualified spouses married to each other and more low qualified spouses married to each other and this is how, as an economist, I would argue that this leads into inequalities between households. So there's a number of explanations that have been forwarded for this positive age gap. Uh, like, uh, one of the leading ones is about gender-specific roles. So this is very much of a traditional argument or, uh, that men are breadwinners and go out and uh, work in the labour market and it takes time for their attractiveness to be revealed because they have to go and prove that they're very good at earning. Whereas women are attractive for other things that are more readily observed. Um, so this is very much of like a 1950s idea of like, you know, uh, men look for one thing from a, a spouse and women look for something different from a spouse. Right? And the idea is that because it takes men longer to go and prove themselves in the labour market that uh, it, they marry at a later age. Another reason that has been forwarded is uh, a uh, biological reason insofar as uh, people marry because they want to have children 
one of the main reasons for marriage is, is children, and women face a biological fecundity constraint that men do not have. So women uh, may tend to want to go and enter into a marriage earlier than them, men because they, they know that they're facing a ticking time clock in order to have children. And there's also been some, uh, some uh, discussion around the, the role of uh, fluctuations in, co in cohort sizes in, in, in uh, producing the age gap. What we do is we're going to look at a situation where it's not possible for everybody to maintain this typical matching pattern, i.e. that uh, matching a spouse who is slightly older than them, who also has the same amount of education as they do. What we specifically do is we, we exploit an educational reform that induced an exogenous increase in education. And this reform has been often used in the literature to elicit causal effects of education. Now, this reform was implemented at the cohort level, so everybody who was born after a specific age was affected by the reform. And this implies that younger cohorts relative to older cohorts are more educated. So therefore, if, if I as a woman am affected by uh, the reform, I want to go and marry someone who's older than me, he was not affected by the reform, it is likely that I have more education than, than he is. And this is the imbalance that we're going to go and be looking at. So what we do find is precisely that, that in the neighbourhood of this discontinuity, it is not possible to, uh, we don't, we've, we find that these typical matching uh, patterns cannot be obtained, uh, and we find that spouses specifically choose smaller uh, age gaps, and uh, it has an impact on the qualifications between the two of them. Uh, so, as I said, like your cohort gaps and uh, the marriage, sorry, fluctuations in cohort sizes and the marriage squeeze has been looked at a lot in, in relation to the age gap uh, margin. What we have, what we, we're not looking at differences in cohort sizes, what we're looking at is a temporary shock to the cross-cohort uh, composition of education between spouses. So if we, uh, I'm going to slip this bit and tell you about the reform in a sec. So the reform we use is the uh, UK reform for school le leaving age that was implemented in 1972. All individuals who were born after September 1957 were required to stay in school until they were 16. Prior to that, they could leave school when they're 15. What's quite uh, very interesting about this particular reform is that it required individuals to stay in school up to uh, the age where the first tier of qualifications are set. So this, by inducing individuals to stay in school for an extra year, it also increased the likelihood that they left education with some type of qualification. And this reform has been used a lot in the, uh, in the economics literature to elicit causal effects of education on things such as personal earnings, but also on an intergenerational uh, outcomes such as uh, the health of children and the education of children and also on lifetime wealth, happiness, and things like crime. So the idea here, and this is what I was saying before, is if, uh, if I'm born in this cohort, I'm, treat, uh, I'm treated by the Rosa, I have uh, more, thank you, I have uh, more education, my candidate spouse is going to go and be from this side who hasn't been uh, treated. Or we can think about it, the other, uh, but that's for me as a woman. If I'm a man, let's just pretend, and I'm born here, I'm going to be uh, looking to go and match with uh, someone who is younger than me. They're born over there, they've also been treated. So there's also a gender difference in how these two, uh, these two things are manifested. So why did I use the uh, ONSNS for this? Well, the analysis, of course, requires relatively rich information on both spouses. So a lot of the survey data that it is possible to get, uh, you have a lot of information from the respondent. You might not have as much information about their spouse. Uh, also, sample size was a very important issue here. So uh, 
this is why, for, for me, the, uh, the ONS longitudinal study was an ideal study to use. Uh, so, uh, created samples, so did a separate, separate analysis for husbands and wives. And uh, if you're interested, this is the method. But uh, to the graphs. So, first of all, looked at the impact on qualifications. I realise that this is probably not coming out too well. This is for wives, this is for husbands, and we can go and see. These are the cohorts before, cohorts afterwards, and there's a very, very large jump in the probability of leaving school with an academic qualification. If I look at the impact on the spousal age difference, we see that there's a, a, this large downward impact for women, but not really for men. And remember, for men who are affected, uh, who are affected by the WASA, they're going to go and be looking for younger women who have also been affected by the WASA, which is why we don't see this big impact for men on age differences, but we do for women. So we see that women are really switching into, uh, around, uh, around this threshold, they're switching into marrying younger partners, i.e. partners from the same cohort as themselves who are also would have been affected for, uh, by this educational report. If you look at the impact of the qualifications difference, we can really see what's happening here. So the qualifications difference of the difference between a husband having a qualification and a wife, we can go and see that uh, these, these differential effects by gender uh, really, really appear that for men, the adjustment actually happens before the threshold, uh, whereas for women, uh, the adjustment happens after. So this is the analytical result, but it basically says exactly what I just wanted to show you in the graphs. So what we found is that the reform induced a substantial decrease in the marital age gap for women, specifically the, that they were switching partners and marrying uh, younger individuals who would have also been affected by the, the, uh, the increase in education. We do find the corresponding but reversed effect in men. It is for men, it's those individuals who were born just before the threshold who cannot receive, who cannot achieve these typical marital matches. So, uh, yes, this is very, very interesting, but this actually has very important implications for uh, some of those papers, uh, the types of papers that I was talking about earlier, that use this type of reform to elicit causal effects of education on a number of different outcomes. If you're thinking about an individual outcome such as your wages, then the, mari then the marriage effect is another channel of, uh, of this education effect. But when we're thinking about household level outcomes such as the impact of parental education on children, right, if the educational reform uh, changes who you marry in the first place, then any effect that you see on the children is attributable to both the fact of parental education and also that, the, that uh, a different spouse may have been chosen. So just a quick uh, reflection of my experience of using the ONS. I'm going to go and say exactly the same as Fran and Matt earlier. There are some setup costs involved. So uh, when I was applying, there was a very, very detailed application that was required. Uh, this was the first time that I had uh, actually applied to use this type of data. So uh, I think I, 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 I had my application vetted a couple of times and returned to me of change. So it took probably a couple of weeks to go and get that application done. Uh, in order to use the data, you need to go in and uh, do some training so uh, on data security. Um, at the time, this was a few years ago, I ended up doing this uh, training, almost exactly the same training, for three different types of, of, of data. That has actually all been amalgamated into this short training now. So once you've done that, not only are you, uh, can you use the, the LS, but there are certain other uh, data sources that, you, that are covered by this training. One of the big setup costs is, of course, that you can only access via the secure settings. So when I was in my PhD, I was actually based in West London, so I was able to come in one day a week uh, for a couple of months in order to go and clean the data. So it wasn't actually that much of a problem for me. Um, and probably because of that reason, it took me longer to go in making you know, get the data 
data together um, because I, I didn't have the setup costs, for instance, that you had. Um, and the clearance procedures takes a little while to go and get used to these, but in order to go and take anything out, you have to first have it vetted, and there are some procedures that the first time you do it, you do it wrong, and they won't allow you to have everything, and then you slowly learn how to, how to do this. Um, however, there are many, many advantages. So uh, there is a help desk, and it's a very, very helpful de uh, help desk. So there, um, that will talk you through all of the stages, um, and at least with me, we're incredibly patient. Um, there's incredibly detailed documentation, uh, as well as this was for me very, very important, that uh, not only is there helpful documentation, but there are people on site, especially if you're working on the Pimlico site, who will uh, carry you towards where to go and get help. Um, and once you have, and I think this is, again, this is the same thing that we were saying earlier, once you've got your, your, your head around how the, uh, the longitudinal study works, there is a possibility of remote coding. So in my analysis, I ended up, I, I actually set up what I called a mirror data set. So I used a different data source, uh, so I used the um, end user license version of the um, labor force survey where I created a sample with exactly the same variables so that I could write my do file to make sure that they worked in the mirror and then I would send the do file into go and run and uh, that was very, very useful. But, of course, there's this huge, vast potential for doing future work. So where I'm working on at the moment is a rather complicated title. I'm looking at the long run health and mortality effects of being exposed to universal health care at birth. Basically what I'm looking at is the, uh, whether there are long-term effects of the introduction of the National Health Service. Uh, this I'm able to go and do precisely because the data and source exists such as the, uh, the longitudinal study. So within the longitudinal study there is information, very rich information of the individual that has been linked to administrative records such as death records. So I have information in here of not only when people were born, but where people were born. born. And, uh, I, and so we, we know that, and then we can observe when they, when they uh, fall out of the sample due to mortality. Go ahead. <laughs> you, uh, you talked about administrative records, you mentioned mortality data. Uh, yes. Of course, presentation mentioned that too. Are there any other administrative records that you let them want to do the data? Uh, so, this is my first foray of using the administrative data that's linked here. I mean, there are other data records that are linked. I know fertility records are linked. I think cancer registrations. Yes. Yeah, so that's so one thing that we're thinking about doing as well, especially with this NHS. Thing is looking at looking at cancer registrations as well. That might be interesting for us. I, I, I'm going to hold my hands up and say that's what I know from the linkage, but we might be able to say more. Uh, oh, of course, yeah. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. I, um, uh, what, the regression equation? Yes. Uh, oh, that's one. I'm happy to go and talk to you about this afterwards if it's a technical question. I'm, I'm frightened that I might lose the room if we go and get too technical. <laughs> Oh, um. 
We can talk over lunch if you like. Yep. Okay.